from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's right after lunch. People are all energized, and now I'm going to depress you with uh, all my concerns about <laughs> collecting social media data. <laughs> um, I'm actually really excited that you know this session is part of the uh, program today because I, you know, we don't do uh, enough thinking around um, you know the ethics of of doing this stuff and um, how to protect people. So I'm really glad to see that um, this panel is part of the program, and I'm glad to be part of it. So where is the, okay. All right. So at a basic level, um, documenting the now is a project to build free and open source tools that are easy to use for collecting, analyzing, and sharing uh, Twitter data. Uh, it's a collaborative project uh, between UC Riverside, the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities at the University of Maryland, um, and Washington University in St. Louis. The, the uh, DocNow team, the, our development team, has been uh, hard at work over the past 10 months, um, you know, really trying to build something great uh, that everyone will be able to use. And I'm really excited for, for what's to come. Uh, but today I'm going to focus less on the technical part um, of our work. What's been really exciting, um, what's been the most exciting part of, of the project, uh, in my opinion, is how, how much people from all kinds of backgrounds um, have engaged with some of the ideas that we've been addressing. Um, and I think those ideas can help us address some of the more serious implications uh, for building collections uh, of data, especially um, as they relate to social media data. So because our work was inspired by the activism uh, and protests that followed the police killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, I think from the beginning uh, of the project, we felt we had an, uh, a responsibility, really, uh, not to forget that there are, in fact, people behind uh, all this data. Um, that's why DocNow has such a focus on ethics of collecting this type of content for long-term preservation. Uh, we've really, we're really interested in how uh, our building of these collections might affect people's lives. Uh, it's also why we're being really transparent with our work while at the same time trying to help build uh, a community of people who also value these, uh, these ideas. Um, so really, you know, at the higher level, uh, DocNow is about a couple of things in my mind. Um, it's about valuing people enough to care about how we collect and steward th uh, their data. And it's about helping to build a community of archives professionals and other folks committed to engaging with content owners and creators in equitable and safe ways uh, as we collect their data. These two things are priorities uh, above our technical work on the project, uh, and a lot of credit really has to go to um, Ed Summers um, for the project being framed this way. Uh, Ed has been my partner in crime over the past couple years uh, doing this work, and he's also a principal investigator um, on, on the DocNow project. So we all agree that there's an immense value in uh, social media data, especially as it relates to our work in archives and libraries. I'm primarily interested in collecting that type of data, uh, especially Twitter, because I think it presents tremendous opportunities to document uh, some aspects, uh, some aspects of African American uh, history and culture. Uh, for example, uh, this is the Pew, um, a graph from the Pew Research um, that talked about uh, how young African Americans are the highest users, uh, among the highest users of, um, of Twitter, especially, right? So a large, a large number of African Americans have found a space where they feel free to share and engage in issues that matter to them, and especially considering how little information we hold in our traditional collections um, about African Americans, you know, I think this is a good opportunity to at least learn about some of those issues, uh, if not collect data about them. So we've also seen the value uh, that platforms such as Twitter um, have had an amplifying voices, right? Um, in the current movement for Black Lives, uh, we've seen it in Arab Spring, and several other social justice events that have uh, played out online. Um, this is a screen, a screenshot from 
the uh, brilliant work of uh, Dean Freelon, Meredith Clark, and Charlton McElwain, um, Ferguson, Black Lives Matter, and the Online Struggle for Offline Justice. Um, I highly suggest you check it out if you get a chance. It's a 90-something page report about the impact that uh, uh, Twitter and other social media had on spreading the message uh, in Ferguson. So all of this is good, but we should also acknowledge the significant responsibility and embrace the challenges that come with collecting, preserving, and making that kind of data accessible. And we should be prepared to do this work in ways that don't compromise people's safety, disregards their rights as content owners and creators, or presents their data in ways that distorts people's original intent. Because we know uh, we're not the only ones interested uh, in, in um, collecting this kind of data, right? So this is a screenshot from a, um, this is a screenshot of an email from a, uh, the ACLU California last week published a report about the uh, growing use of um, social media collection tools by law enforcement, especially local law enforcement. Um, and you know, they were able to get their hands on a lot of documents for this. And this is a, um, a screenshot from an email that a company, uh, Geofedia, which is really popular in this space right now, uh, is sending out um, uh, to its clients about Ferguson. It's saying, you know, hey, we have a lot of good stuff on uh, Ferguson protesters here. Click here to view the collection. And you know, here I think the ACLU articulates uh, really well you know, the danger um, to people of color and other minority groups uh, when police start uh, using these kinds of tools, right? And for those in the back, I'll go ahead and read this. The racist, implications of, the racist implications of social media surveillance technology are not surprising. We know that when law enforcement gets to conceal the use of surveillance technology, they also get to conceal its misuse. Discriminatory policing that targets communities of color is unacceptable and secretive. Sophisticated surveillance technologies supersize the impact of racial profiling and abuse. Right, so there are some real issues uh, we have to consider here. How will our collections of social media data uh, be different than those built by law enforcement or private security firms? Um, I think that's a question we all need to uh, um, uh, think about. Here's an image of two prominent activists uh, who became well-known during the Ferguson protests. Uh, here they're being labeled as threat actors uh, by a private security firm. Uh, this is DeRay McKesson um, on the left and uh, Jonetta uh, Elsie. Um, I think this is in relation to um, the uh, Baltimore uprising um, when they found out that um, this company, especially uh, Zero Fox, was doing a lot of data collection for um, local law enforcement. So it's a scary uh, situation because these companies are increasingly interested in, t in this data as a way to punish people for being active citizens. Uh, when Ed Summers, and I'm dropping Ed's name a lot here today, you're gonna owe me a beer after this. Um, when Ed Summers first published uh, a blog post about the Ferguson Twitter data set uh, we collected during the first month uh, of that event, a private security firm was one of the first groups uh, to reach out to him asking if they could ac access that data, right? It's a real concern for people in our profession uh, to be aware of. So for example, how do we make sure that the massive uh, Twitter data archive being built right here at the Library of Congress uh, doesn't become a tool that these groups can use against already marginalized people, right, whose only request is that the police start, stop killing them. So how will the library respond to requests from private security firms and law enforcement for that data? Part of the answer is that we have to engage directly with people generating uh, social media data to understand how our work in collecting this type of data might affect their lives. Um, I think that will be an important way for us to uh, uh, come up with some policies around, uh, uh, around offering public access uh, to, to some of this content. Um, it's a difficult task, but I think it's possible. And you know, it's especially uh, tough because, because of the number of people who, um, who can engage with an issue on a social media platform at any given time, right? That number can be daunting. Um, I'm not sure how large the LC uh, Twitter data set is now, but I'm sure it's significant. Uh, and just in the past couple weeks, um, Ed has collected almost two million tweets related to the police killings of uh, Keith Scott in Charlotte and uh, Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa. Um, 
so it's a big job, but I think it's possible. There are ways to engage if we're willing uh, to drop some of our traditional models of building collections uh, that prioritize our ideas about professionalism and the myth of neutrality over the wishes of people and communities. So last month, the uh, DocNow project hosted our first advisory board uh, meeting uh, in St. Louis. Um, and this was an opportunity to get our awesome uh, advisory board members. I'm sure some of these names are, these faces are familiar to you. Um, to get together for a deep dive into many of the issues we've been raising around social media, web archiving, ethics, and uh, technology uh, over the past year. And, you know, this was a really, uh, we had six really great panels um, of insightful and challenging discussions. Um, and I really hope you'll check them out on our website, docnow.io, uh, when you get a chance, because I don't think this type of, this group of, uh, of people really has, has been brought together before in the context of sort of archiving uh, uh, digital media, web archives. So um, definitely check it out if you get a chance. It's in the meetings page um, on our website. Um, but I want to focus on just one of those panels for the last few minutes because I think it's a great example of the type of community work we're going to need uh, to engage in um, in the future if we want to continue building these types of data sets uh, as, as archives. Uh, the panel uh, was made up of four activists from Ferguson um, who were some of the many organizers uh, in Ferguson after Michael Brown's killing. Um, it included uh, Alexis Templeton, Rasheen Aldridge, Kayla Reed and Ruben Riggs, and it was really expertly moderated by Dr. Jonathan Fenderson, who's a faculty member at Washington University. Um, and, and I was really thankful for the activists uh, for joining us because, you know, these are people who have nine to fives, they're students, um, and they took time out of their day to be with us for, an, for, for a good chunk, chunk of the day, and so we really appreciated that. And, you know, they really added a richness and a realness um, uh, to the event that we wouldn't have um, we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, you know, and they talked about their lives before Ferguson, they talked about their lives during Ferguson, and their lives now, and there were some really difficult conversations that, that, that happened uh, on that panel. It's about an hour and a half long, um, our longest panel of the day. And you know, I, I think that there's some, real, um, there's some real good stuff in there, so check it out. I'm seeing my five minutes um, cue here. So I'll go ahead and stop here, but I wanna share a short clip from that panel with you. It's about six minutes long, so. <laughs> um, and I'll just leave it open and then we can get into um, conversation that way. So let's see if this will work. It worked during testing. So you all are in a room full of people who are really interested in um, Documenting the now, right? Yeah. To try to try, try to be able to capture what's happening, uh, particularly with social movements as it's happening, right? And so, um, one of the things that's really interesting is that. Sorry, you're going to hear from Alexis first and Kayla second. This is a story that you all helped create, helped make into a global story, but at the same time, it's a story, and and in many ways, attempted to control via Twitter. Right? But at the same time, it's a story that's become so big that it's also beyond any of your control. Right? And so one of the questions I really wanted to get at was, how do you all want the movement to be remembered? And what are some of the things that you would like people doing research around your lives, your work? Um, what are some of the things you want them to be conscious of? You can't stop them. right? But what are some of the things you would want them to keep in mind as they're doing that work? Um, can I go first? Yes. Go All right, cool. So, um, to like, really iffy about, um, I guess I'm more so just talking to like the black folks in the room. Um, when documenting the movement, like internally, like, don't, don't wash out like the internal politics of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, um, the argument, like, don't, don't wash that stuff out. Don't wash away the homophobia. Don't wash away the sexism. Like, don't, don't wash away the misogyny. Like, don't wash away those frontline stories about what was happening to people, like, internally and how people felt unsafe, like, with people they were fighting next to. Like, don't leave that out because 
we, we have in all our movements and it leaves people so scorned and so hurt and so bitter, which is why a lot of the arguments happen online, which mm -hmm. is why like, you know, they don't really bother me because it, it also humanizes our movement and I don't think we've got that with a lot of, mm -hmm. with, I don't think we've gotten that with any black movement that we've had. They've never been humanized. They always felt they had to be perfect when fighting the system and we just, we just fucking aren't. Like, <laughs> we just aren't, we're depressed. Um, we, we like to drink and smoke to cope. Like, we curse, like we have kids, we have jobs, like we're married, we're not, like we're scorned, like whatever, like we're human, you know? And like, I don't want people to forget that. Like I actually humanize the people out there, these everyday people, because they're literally like, just like y'all in this room. Yeah. Um, and like, we can't, we just can't wash them out of the story. Real quick, I saw the uh, five-minute uh, sign, so yeah. we got to wrap it tight. Quick. Yeah, so my bad. for me, it's so that, 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 that's really important. And the other thing I would add to that, um, the other thing I would add to that is just the idea of um, what Ruben was hinting to, that social media at first was this super democratized space, but it somewhat perpetuates elitism. Mm. Um, that for those of us who have a, pla like I have uh, like 15,000 followers, Alexis is, whatever, it changes. <laughs> um, but it's a lot. And so people some, like, mistakenly val put your value at how many people choose to follow you. Mm -hmm. And leadership isn't based on how many followers you have online. Leadership is based on how many people you're invested in and developing on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so some of my, the most important things that I feel like I accomplished in the last two years maybe it weren't told on social media, mm -hmm. right? Because um, they didn't need to be told on social media. And my development into self and our relationships, like that, those stories aren't told on social media. And so just being conscious of the fact that for every face that you see that has been lifted up, that we are standing on the shoulders of hundreds of giants that we'll never even see again. And Ferguson wasn't because the four of us just came together in a huddle and said, we're going to fight for black liberation. It's because thousands of people in St. Louis say, yo, this is messed up, and I'm not going to let this do it. I'm not going to let this stand. And we see those people every time we go to Target, hopefully when you don't go to Walmart, um, <laughs> when you go into your local <laughs> fast food spot, you see those people who, for a moment, say, I'm going to give all of myself um, to a space and then go back to life. And so we've been epically um, blessed, like we worked for it, but also part of it is just this crazy equation that happened that put us in the elevated space. And so our job in the elevated space is to always fight for those who aren't in those spaces and represent them well. And I think we really try to do that, but that's your job is to tell those stories, to find those people. And if you can't find those people, at least create space for that narrative to be, to be built that like, for the rest of my life, I owe people I'll never know. And mm -hmm. I, take that, I take that shit so seriously. You know, mm -hmm. like, in every space I represent, it's like my mom and my grandma are, like, behind some window I can't see. That's the way I need to behave because people literally sacrifice their lives and comfort um, for, for one person. And we, we have somewhat benefited from it, right? And somewhat been super traumatized by it. But in and, and, and the benefit has come more trauma. Um, but like accept that and like tell all of, like tell our whole selves. And so I, I made this commitment in therapy because I didn't go to therapy before Ferguson. But I made this commitment that said like, I will love, I commit to my community and myself to love us in our entirety. And that, that, that's the non-romantic stories. That's the, we were hungry, we didn't have food. That's the subway lady giving us a sandwich when we ain't had no money. That's then her getting cancer and putting up a GoFundMe and reaching out to Ferguson activists who have become, had platforms now to say, y'all, I have cancer when she would come out every single night and ask us, did we need to use the restroom again before the subway closed? That's a story that a lot of people don't know, but was so important to just how we sustain that that kind of community existed. All right. Okay, where's... All right, so that's all I have and look forward to the discussion. Hello. It's an extremely tough act to follow. 
thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to thank um, NDI, Kate, uh, for, for this wonderful opportunity to participate in such a terrific event. So, so my talk um, is a rehash of a paper that we put together for uh, the upcoming IPRES conference. And so it's less about the ethical considerations of this work and more about the technical um, uh, side of the work, but I'm certainly happy to, to talk about ethics in the Q&A. Um, so I'd like to give a shout out to uh, the co-authors, and I invite them to chime in to correct and expand as needed. I welcome that. I also want to shout out to uh, Julia Kim and Melissa Lindbergh in the American Folklife Center, who are the ones in receipt of these big piles of ones and zeros, and they push them through our system for preservation, and um, we couldn't do it without them. I also want to um, take a minute at, the, at a forum like this to acknowledge uh, the AFC director, Betsy Peterson, and other senior leaders at, in library services and in web services for sort of recognizing the importance of these projects and creating conditions where this kind of experimentation and innovation uh, can exist. So today I'll be talking about a collaboration among the, uh, my library colleagues to pull down web content for preservation and access that moves us beyond uh, classic web archiving methods. And I'll focus on two community collecting projects, uh, one to solicit and harvest um, community-generated photos off of Flickr, and then another is to gather oral narratives generated through a relatively new StoryCorps mobile application. So both projects involve a public call to action and they prompt public engagement in building library collections. Uh, they leverage our partnerships, or by leveraging or uh, partnering with third-party software platforms, these efforts allow us to focus on preservation and long-term access of records while still supporting immediate and dynamic engagement with communities. Um, Kate got into it a little bit, but just a, a brief background on the American Folklife Center. Uh, we are a large ethnographic archive um, with, with more than uh, five million items, closer to six. Um, and these collections include extensive audiovisual documentation of traditional arts, cultural expressions, uh, oral histories, and, and they offer uh, researchers access to songs, stories, and other creative expressions uh, of people from, from diverse communities. Um, and as mentioned, they range from wax cylinders created in 1890 uh, that we talked about yesterday at the conference in the other building uh, to, to the Born Digital uh, StoryCorps collection, among, among many others. And we have pretty much every uh, technology, AV technology in between, represented in our collection. Um, I'll mention, too, that we're perhaps best known for our collection of field recordings. Um, these are performances of songs, uh, instrumental music by little known grassroots musicians, but also by famous uh, musicians such as Elizabeth Cotton, Aunt Molly jo Jackson, Woody Guthrie, Lead Belly, Jelly Roll Morton, Burl Ives, Johnny Cash, and so on. Uh, some of whom did very famous uh, performances right on this very stage um, it, that are in our archives. Um, all right, so moving ahead maybe. Um, the American Folklife Center was uh, created in 1976 by an act of Congress, uh, and we have a wide-ranging mandate uh, to preserve and to present uh, folklife. And so I'm showing you just a snippet of the legislation, the verbiage from the legislation, which defines um, uh, what, what folklife is and, and sort of sets our tone uh, for, for a collecting scope, uh, which I would say is broad, if not uh, wildly ambitious to, tr to try to get all of this uh, documented. So I want to point out that the digital collecting initiatives that I'm going to talk about are part of a, a long history of the archives of soliciting pol uh, public collaboration in documenting the cultural record. Uh, even with the founding of the archives, uh, Robert Winslow Gordon went out and recorded um, singers to document American folk song. Um, of course, 
Alan Lomax, uh, right after Pearl Harbor, uh, who was then the assistant in charge of the archive, uh, sent a telegram to field workers uh, in various locations throughout the United States uh, telling them to please do man on the street interviews to get people's reactions uh, to, to what had happened. Uh, we've since built on that tradition with doing the same for 9-11, uh, for sermons and orations that were commemorating um, the inauguration of um, the first African American president uh, and so on. So of course, with the uh, proliferation of smartphones, tablets, and wireless uh, internet connections, net networked communication is increasingly where the cultural record is being documented. And so AFC staff have long recognized uh, this need to preserve folk expression on the web, um, and until now have, have not had but paper tools to do them. So you'll see we have a very uh, respectable collection of uh, scam emails uh, that are in boxes printed out. Um, but anyway, we've since evolved, uh, and in June 2014, um, we worked with uh, Abby Grotke's team in the Web Archiving Program to create um, a web cultures collection. And we co-curate this with, with scholars who study digital culture, um, and we're capturing a set of sites that um, document the digital vernaculars. Um, and so we're up to about 49 sites, uh, ranging from Know Your Meme, uh, there's a pepper spray everything meme, that's one, uh, on that site, and the, to, to creepypasta.com. Feel free to Google that later. <laughs> All right, so um, our, just briefly, yeah, I love that one so much. Um, anyway, so we're looking at uh, sets, that, we're looking at sites that document, um, you know, communities that are, um, engaging with each other, DIY communities, fan communities, um, people talking about urgent le urban legends and lore. Again, these are just extensions of the kinds of um, documentation that we have uh, in the analog. All right, so by way of background, um, the Library of Congress has been uh, collecting web archives since 2000 and has a well-established practice for acquiring and processing uh, the collections. Most uh, website collections are harvested uh, via a crawler tool, Heratrix, uh, and they are saved into a format called WARC. Um, the crawler works from a list of known seeds that are uh, starting URLs, and uh, then it's, uh, you're doing a great job. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it crawls to a specific de depth from each uh, one following internal links on websites. Um, there's no verification against uh, the original source, that's not possible in this context, but um, the results are subjectively reviewed, and these methods are appropriate uh, for collecting documentation of, of everyday life, uh, but they're, they're different and um, distinctive from the kinds of abilities that were offered in these two projects I'm going to talk about in 10 minutes or less. Um, okay. We first started working with uh, library developers uh, to um, collect user-submitted uh, photographs via Flickr uh, that document Halloween, Day of the Dead, and the other um, sort of constellation of holidays that surround uh, late October, early November. So participants were asked to um, post photos to Flickr with, a, uh, with a, that hashtag. We've done it again, uh, we did it again last year. Um, and then uh, have a Creative Commons license accompanying that. We've since expanded that. Uh, this is our 40th, year, 40th anniversary of the center, and so we've asked people to document their traditions and, and do the same thing. So at the end of the calendar year, uh, we'll be working again with developers to pull that, pull that content into our archives. Um, so the, the Flickr harvesting projects, like the StoryCorps project I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, you know, have these contours that are well suited for a different approach to acquiring and, and processing. Uh, there's no external links uh, in the data, no easy list of seeds that uh, link to the collections externally, and most of the data was created, um, uh, well, in the case of StoryCorps, in an, in an app. Um, and so the data sets, they also need to be treated differently um, in terms of access, uh, but in the case of StoryCorps, uh, well, and K Flickr, access is being handled by these third parties, so, so that lets us off the hook for, for, for now. Um, 
Okay, so anyway, uh, at the library we seem to have settled into a rhythm uh, where uh, we treat born digital data sets and, and web harvesting as two dependent but related practices. Uh, data sets are generally collected in um, time or tag bound chunks by querying an external API. They're downloaded onto LC storage in Bagot structure um, and then continue through the usual workflow, uh, depending on whether they're slated for preservation or online access or, or both. Okay, so let me just move quickly into the StoryCorps um, uh, example. So this venture is an extension of a, a long-standing relationship we've had with StoryCorps. Uh, StoryCorps started in 2003. They're now the, uh, among the largest oral narrative projects uh, of, of their kind. And interviews have been collected at mobile booths and uh, at permanent story booths located in New York, uh, Chicago, San Francisco and Atlanta. The traditional interview is uh, two people who know each other talking with a facilitator for about 40 minutes in a booth. Um, and then each record, recording uh, is preserved uh, at the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. Um, and then these snippets, snippets of this stuff uh, gets broadcast on National Public Radio's Morning Edition. Um, and so since the inception of the project in 2003, the signature, what we're calling, you know, face-to-face uh, -face StoryCorps is, um, they've garnered more than 67,000 uh, interviews. And so then in 2015, uh, founder Dave Isay won the TED Prize, uh, which when you win the TED Prize, you get a million dollars, which is great. Um, so Dave wanted to create an app um, to, to take StoryCorps global, and so he did. And so we were like, whoa, okay, let's do this. So, um, <laughs> so we worked with um, StoryCorps developers uh, to put something together. And that's what I'll talk about. So as StoryCorps developers were designing their app, they worked with the software developers here at the library to identify, design, and construct this transfer mechanism. Um, the team agreed that an API would benefit both parties. Uh, the library could, could receive or fetch. Oh boy, five. Um, and then um, it would allow StoryCorps to expose their collection for harvesting instead of spending staff time prepping it and pushing it out to us. Um, so one of the main requirements for the API was the need for fixities. Um, while StoryCorps developers considered their content fluid, library developers were adamant that uh, we need things to be fixed, right? Um, and so explaining this to an external partner was beneficial, of course, because uh, uh, it's a technical facet of the library world that um, exposes archival preservation practices uh, more broadly. This was where my cool graphic was going to go to explain that, but I couldn't do it. Um, anyway, so each interview package consists of metadata files, uh, JSON format, and um, there's an optional upload of a photo, a selfie, with your interview partner uh, in JPEG, and then an MP3 audio file. And that, those are um, discrete packets that are served up. Um, and StoryCorps was happy to add the checksum feature, which is like a digital fingerprint of sorts. Um, against which later comparisons can be made for errors. And so um, the MP3 was uh, hosted at Story, uh, SoundCloud, and StoryCorps wasn't sure if SoundCloud would be cool with um, adding that, but they were, after a little bit of back and forth, happy, happy to do that for us. So that made it a lot better. Um, so then decisions had to be made, like, you know, um, what about the associated metadata? Like, do, do we care about likes? Do we care about um, descriptive tags? Um, you know, we, we, we decided likes were too um, fluid and a snapshot at an arbitrary point in time seemed a little bit meaningless. And, but we certainly thought tags were incredibly important across metadata, rocking and all. Um, so anyway, once developers were happy um, with the general design of the transfer mechanism, then both parties began to iterate and uh, StoryCorps on the API, API side and um, the library on the fetching side. Um, and I will blow through a few technical details. Uh, anyway, uh, there were two, so in, in doing this work, just to jump to um, the two big classes of errors that we were trying to protect against um, were one, uh, a single file or a tape gets destroyed, in which case the checksum re will reveal this. And then the second um, class of error would be losing access to a collection through uh, correlated errors, which is a class of mistakes where somebody follows a bad practice uh, or relied upon bad code. In that case, an inventory can help identify um, those kinds of things. 
and then they can make a copy. Okay, so this is how um, the development is going. Um, you've, the, I'll just move ahead. <laughs> All right, well, so in closing, um, you know, these projects have enabled AFC to engage a broad public uh, to collaboratively build its collections, as it's always done. Um, and we're able to do so in an automated way and, a, and in a way that bakes in so, uh, sound preservation practices, which, which we love. And if there's time to play a one and a half minute clip, okay. Um, I'd like to close with this clip from um, a StoryCorps.me interview, and I want to say that, you know, this is a tremendous corpus, a research corpus, these interviews, and they do get dinged sometimes for being overtly sentimental, the, the stuff you hear on Friday, and, and this is no exception, so um, <laughs> enjoy, but I'll leave you with this. Well, this last question basically just says, take time to tell your interview partner what they mean to you. And uh, so I'm going to say that to you. Um, I absolutely adore you. You're easily the best thing that's ever happened to me in any way, shape, or form. While, like you said earlier, there's so many things that we may still be unsure about with our future, I can at least, I can at least say that I know I want you in it. So in the home that we've built together, in the lives that we've made together with each other, and in the family that we've started with our little furry friend here, Asia, Colleen, Tanette, Adcock, will you do me the greatest honor? And will you marry me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what better way than to talk about all the wonderful things that we've done in our lives so far and, and then just think about the great things that's going to happen in the future. Oh my gosh, you're so amazing. And I, and I don't know if you know, I, I didn't tell you this yet, but um, I, this could also be saved in the, uh, in the Library of Congress's archives <laughs> forever. <laughs> So that everyone can listen to this. So happy. <laughs> I love you so much. I love you too. This has been my interview <laughs> slash surprise proposal to my wonderful girlfriend and now fiance, Asia. <laughs> I'm Rory T. Miller, now the happiest man in the world. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I have never had a simultaneous translator before. So let me begin by saying to all of you, pumpernickel, flapjack, chandelier, riboflavin, hockey puck, calzone, moose antlers. Uh, I owe you a drink. My name is Maciej Cegłowski. I run a little web archive for about 20,000 people. So to be invited to the Library of Congress is like being a kid who glued some fins to a cardboard tube and was invited to tell NASA about rocket propulsion. Uh, like every speaker has correctly said, it is a signal honor to be here. It feels especially strange for me because I'm used to talking about the US government as a big, scary adversary. But here I am in a government institution that, despite the fact that we all went through a metal detector to sit here, uh, champions not just freedom, but the fundamental right to privacy and the dignity that that entails. During the panic that followed September 11th, Carla Hayden, who was then head of the American Library Association, took a principled stand against provisions in the Patriot Act that required libraries to divulge what their patrons were reading. Uh, she did this in the face of ridicule from the Attorney General and the administration. And of course, now she is the Librarian of Congress. So what a wonderful institution. Uh, so it's particularly sad, feel free to applaud about that, that, yeah, what a woman. So for me, it is, it is depressing to think that those provisions that seem so threatening and un-American look almost quaint now when compared to what we have done in the commercial internet to destroy privacy. Uh, you know, libraries have a commitment to protect 
information about what their patrons are reading. But Amazon knows every book that you've read. If it's electronic, they know it down to the page. Google has your correspondence, your web history, your phone company knows where you are and where you've been based on a device you voluntarily carry with you. We all know the depressing litany. Um, and in some ways, the commercial internet is the opposite of a library. You know, the libraries exist to inform. The commercial internet is there to extract as much information as possible. There's no ulterior motives in a library that I know about, but when you're online, there's an ulterior motive behind every link. Every click is there so that you share something or click something else or stay on the page, pay attention to an ad. But these unlibrarians that I unfortunately represent have made enormous advances in technology. And I'm here today to talk to you about machine learning. I want you to hear it from me rather than out on the street or from your friends. Uh, because I've come to think that these machine learning techniques that are amazing are kind of like a deep fat fryer. If you have never deep fried something in your life, it's life changing. You taste it, it's amazing, and then you start to think, this would work with anything. <laughs> and you're kind of right, it does. Like in my college days, I had friends who worked at the snack bar and they conducted lots of research along these lines. They would deep fry cheese, candy, pens, name tags, and it all came out tasting pretty good. Uh, and then as you know, if you subsist on it like you do in college, it kind of gives you a, a, a little bit of a hangover. Um, in our case, the deep fryer is this toolbox of statistical techniques. The names keep changing. It used to be unsupervised learning. Now it's called big data or deep learning, AI, machine learning. Next year, there's gonna be a new buzzword, but the core ideas don't change. You feed your computer lots of data and it learns how to recognize structure. Uh, now, in any deep frying situation, you wanna ask yourself, what is the stuff being fried in? Uh, in Poland in the 70s, where, where I'm from, there was a crafty person who bought a high pressure deep fryer from Italy, and they brought it to a, a resort town in the mountains. They called it the Frico Polo, and people would stand in line for blocks uh, you had to bring your own chicken because this was under communism, but if you brought your own chicken, in three minutes it would be high pressure deep fried and returned to you as the most delicious, hot, tasty thing you had ever eaten. And this was a huge fad until the health department came and closed it down, at which point it was revealed that the Frico Polo machine had never been cleaned and what the stuff inside it was basically black tar and that's where the, the flavor secret of the Frico Polo. Um, so what is your data getting fried in, right? These algorithms train on very large collections that you don't know anything about, and sites like Google operate on scales hundreds of times bigger than what we're familiar with in the humanities. Um, for this reason, I've referred to machine learning as, uh, as money laundering for bias, because you can smuggle in a lot of preconceptions based on how you train. Um, so for example, if you go to Google Translate and you plug in an Arabic article about something horrible in Syria, or an opinion piece on terrorism, you get something in English that looks like it's written by a native speaker. But if you put in, uh, in Arabic, a kid's letter home from camp, say, or a passage from a novel, it looks like it was written by the Frankenstein monster. Uh, the, the algorithm just can't handle it and doesn't know. And it's not because the algorithm is obsessed with war and, and things military, that's just what it was trained on to do. I'm sure other languages have other idiosyncrasies. It's not always a problem. Some uses of machine learning are benign and, and wonderful. If you do optical character recognition, you benefit from, from a lot of these advances. Uh, but others are problematic. I would be very wary of using sentiment analysis, for example, on any collection, or anything to do with social networks, uh, without careful thought as to, as to where it had trained. I find it helpful to think of algorithms as a like dim-witted but extremely industrious graduate student who you don't fully trust. So if you want a concordance or an index, or you want them to go through 10 million photos and tell you where there are horses, then that's perfect. But if you want them to draw conclusions on gender based on word use patterns, or if you want to do social network analysis on census data, then you want some adult, adult supervision in the room uh, when they're active. But besides these issues of bias, it's really the opportunity cost that irks me. This love affair with computational techniques removes a lot of the potential for surprise that comes when you deal with actual people. Because if you go searching for patterns in your data, you're gonna find patterns in your data. You know, woohoo, right? Uh, what gets lost in, in that data is what's fresh and really interesting and different. Um, and we've seen entire fields disappear down the numerical rabbit hole. Economics came first, sociology and political science are still trying to get out. Bioinformatics is down there somewhere and has not been heard from in a while. Uh, 
In my eyes, the, the excitement's not in the computational possibilities. The computers are a tool and they eliminate some drudgery and it's fun and deep fry some things, it's, it's tasty, but the real excitement is in human potential because for the first time we can make things available to anyone on the planet and I don't think we've internalized the enormity of that step. Now, as you all know, just throwing the data online is not the answer. Uh, when I was a... <laughs> I'm laughing because the Andrew Mellon Foundation once hired me as a program officer. That was, that was crazy of them. But when I was a program officer at the Mellon Foundation, I remember working with uh, early JSTOR and finding out that 50% of JSTOR records had never appeared in a search results page. So not only had no one read them, no one had even seen them. They might not as well not have been digitized. Uh, and part of that was because of res extremely restrictive agreements with publishers, but part of it was a failure of imagination. Uh, here you have every journal article under the sun and no attempt to connect it to people outside of the academy. Uh, for the same reason, we completely flubbed Wikipedia at, at, at Mellon. Nobody could imagine that the effort would succeed. I remember my boss went as far as, as exploring whether to print a copy of it and have it published uh, that way, but, <laughs> but that's where we stalled. And then later, uh, after leaving Mellon, I saw librarians fail to engage with some vibrant communities at Flickr and Delicious in early days, uh, services that they later grew to love, basically because of a lack of trust and openness to an experiment around unstructured tagging. When we talk about data, a lot of our language is extractive. You talk about data flows, data mining, data crunching. It's like a rocky substance that you have to smash to get the jewels out. I like that. Um, but in cultivating communities, I prefer to think of a gardening metaphor. You need the right conditions, a propitious climate, and a judicious sprinkling of bullshit. But it also requires some patience and weeding and tending, and the ability to accept that you don't know exactly what is going to grow. If we take seriously the idea that digitizing collections makes them more accessible, then we have to accept that the kinds of people and activities that those collections attract are going to seem odd to us. We have to give up that control. It should make perfect sense because human cultures are famously diverse. It's normal that there's different kinds of music and food and dance. We enjoy these differences. Unless you're a Silicon Valley nerd, you delight in the fact that there are hundreds of different kinds of cuisine rather than a single beige slurry that gives you all your nutrition. But when we go online, our horizons narrow. We expect that domain experts and programmers can meet everyone's needs anywhere. We think it's normal to build a social network for seven billion people. I call this the Mormon bartender problem when you try to make things for people while lacking the visceral experience of their lives, imagining that you can just think your way through it. I'll give you an example from my own website. I run a very vanilla bookmark archive where people save URLs for later. So it's a search engine for scholars, journalists. I even have a priest who researches his sermons on it, which I'm happy about. But one of the biggest groups of users on my site are writers of fan fiction. Um, I'll explain what fan fiction is because you're all going to pretend you don't know, even though I know all the librarians here are, are avid writers of it. So this is a vibrant subculture of people who write stories, often highly erotic, that are set in various fictional universes. If you always thought that there were sparks between Holmes and Watson, uh, this is the subculture for you, and I encourage you to come explore it. Uh, so fanfic authors came to my site, adopted the tagging system, and to them, it's a search engine and publication tool. It's not an archive at all uh, in, in the sense that I intended it and they do a lot of additional technical work to make, it, to make it suit their needs. For me, it was like watching bees arrive in your garden and set up a hive and you know, make honeycombs and honey. I, you just observe and wonder and hope you don't get stung. Uh, it was a, a, really a wonderful experience. But it made me think the internet has to get a lot, lot weirder than it is. People out there are, are also tired of this deep fried data flavor and they want substance. They do interesting things, but you have to trust them first. In an institutional setting, this can be frightening. It takes courage to ask for a grant to bring a collection online when you have no measurable outcomes other than the hope that it'll attract something interesting. It takes even more courage to award such a grant. It takes courage for a young faculty member to devote time and energy into projects that someone might use to make a cat video. I realize that that's not you know, the, the royal road to tenure at most institutions. And it takes courage to commit to maintaining those collections uh, for a long time and for staying engaged with the people who use them. But the search for intelligent life on the internet means you have to put away some preconceptions about who your communities of use are. Now, I thought the fanfic authors on my site were just pursuing a harmless, quirky hobby. 
What I didn't realize is that online, the frivolous blends easily with the serious. Fanfic authors tend to be women. Britta Gustafson has called fandom a secret seminar on feminism. Young fans use stories to explore issues of gender identity, and in some cases, they use fandom to discover that there's something called gender identity that they're allowed to have and think about and question. Uh, and they do it through the medium of something they genuinely enjoy. Um, they learn to deconstruct plot elements in, in writing in a way that would make a Russian structuralist critic blush. Uh, they coach each other in writing better. They coach each other in technology. Uh, because serious people enjoy frivolous things and they mix and mingle with young people at the same time, it becomes a sort of secret educational system that works in surprising ways. My friend Sasha Judd, who in an upcoming talk will describe something similar with fans of the boy band One Direction. Uh, the band has an obsessive following, again, of young women, and in chronicling the lives of these beloved band members, they reach heights of technical achievement that media companies can't get to. Uh, they are de facto professional archivists, developers, video editors, and journalists, but they don't think of themselves that way. And to real technologists, in quotes, these interests aren't serious, so they don't matter. So these women would never dream of applying to jobs that they're already effectively doing. I think of this as like a dark matter of talented, motivated, and interested people online who just aren't connected. Uh, and I'm convinced our time is much better spent trying to reach them and engage them than playing with the same algorithmic toys. I've talked a bit about bringing uh, collections online and, and, and making them accessible. There's also the question of how to deal with the flood of stuff that is already on the internet and coming from it. One approach is to go to people who have control of the data, the big companies, and partner with them to study it. Uh, I think that this is awkward, though, because the very thing that the Librarian of Congress objected to in the Patriot Act, this intrusive, constant surveillance, is the bread and butter of online services. Much of the valuable information is co collected in ways that would never pass ethical standards in academia, and ways that even the NSA would be constrained by law from using. But the data is there. There are no laws that constrict us, constrain us from collecting it however we want. And I know that you can hear that data calling to you. It's saying, study me, preserve me. These fly-by-night companies, they're going to lose me. Analyze me. You can try to add layers of ethical paint to this conundrum and say that you're really helping. But I worry about legitimizing a culture of universal surveillance like this. I'm very uneasy when I see social scientists working with Facebook, for example. You know, people are pragmatic. In the absence of meaningful privacy protections, their approach to privacy has become click OK and pray. Every once in a while, there's a big hack that shakes everybody up. But since we have yet to see a really big, tragic misuse of personal information, we're just kind of hoping it doesn't happen. But remember, we live in a time when this spiritual successor to fascism is on the ascendant in a lot of Western democracies. Having large, unregulated collections of private information harvested from people, often without their knowledge, is just dangerous. Don't legitimize it. People face social pressures to abandon their privacy. Being on social media has become an expected part of getting a job or an apartment in places. Now the Border Patrol wants to look at your social media data. So when you work with online behemoths, realize that the behavioral information is not consensual, and there can't be consent to this kind of mass surveillance. It's an illusion. I want to talk momentarily about my bread and butter, which is actually collecting websites. I hope you'll forgive me for being technical in this part of the talk, but the average web page right now is a giant pile of steaming garbage. Uh, I don't mean the content, but I mean the way it, it's structured and fits together. So everything is a Frankenstein monster of dependencies and JavaScripts and things pulled in at, at display time. And what does it mean to archive this, these steaming piles of garbage? Uh, you can save the rendered image in the browser, but then you forgo all the dynamic behaviors it might have. Uh, you know, is a dynamic ad on a page just an annoyance, or is it a valuable window on life in 2016? And if it is, then which of the ads are we supposed to archive, and you know, how do we pull it in, uh, uh, and who should it be targeted to? You know, you, um, you end up in a situation where you have to build a simulator of the entire computing environment of today, and I don't think future generations will forgive us for doing that. It's bad enough to live through it now. Um, <laughs> game developers have already wrestled through this program. They have stuff that we can learn from because they've tried to emulate video games 
including classic ones that turn out to be surprisingly hard. They were implemented in hardware. But the reason these game developers are able to do it is because they're also passionate about playing those games and continuing to have them and teaching them to their kids. So once again, communities pop up as, as kind of a, a lifesaver. One problem that an institution like the Library of Congress faces is you can't just kind of you know, roll up your sleeves and go in there willy-nilly and say, we'll archive however we can because what you do will be considered normative and then everybody will follow the lead. So I understand it's a dicey problem, but communities can help us. Um, an example from LiveJournal might, might help. So LiveJournal is an early blog site that was very popular. One of the features it had was for every post, you could have a little thumbnail type image. And what began happening is people would use those images as a sort of gloss on the post. They would kind of riff against what they had written with their choice of, of thumbnails. So some people would have hundreds or thousands of these images, and it became a sort of art for how to, uh, how to do commentary the silent way. LiveJournal, totally unaware of this, imposed a limit of 16 images, and it was a retroactive limit. So they destroyed a lot of the value in their archive without even knowing that they had done anything. Um, it's easy to, to say that, well, you, know, you, you, you talk to your users, you find out about this, but I think a lot of stuff falls in between the cracks when people use multiple sites. People's online presence is complicated. And it's not limited to one or two places. So the only way to know how to preserve is to talk to them. Uh, the, the problem isn't that we can't store this stuff. We have more than enough storage. It's just that we can't recreate these environments in a faithful way without bringing in all of the operating systems and browsers and ad, ad networks that exist now, which is an impossible task. Focusing on communities, like I said, means relinquishing control. It's scary. But there are some key steps we can follow. So making materials available in open formats without restrictions, with a serious commitment to having a URL be a permanent promise, goes a long way. Uh, publishing text as text, um, uh, APIs like we've seen talked about today, which I find very encouraging, and uh, a commitment to fair use that the Copyright Office has also shown uh, so that people can freely create and stitch this stuff together without fear of, uh, of automated robot emails from lawyers. I want to give my wistful closing, closing memory in of the, a place I never thought I'd be wistful about, the Glenview Public Library. Uh, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, and it was a suburban library like any other. But like a lot of nerdy kids of my generation, I spent half of my adolescence there or at home reading books that I checked out from there. It was my window on the world before the internet. And I never reflected why this unremarkable suburban library existed, or who funded it, or where its values came from, or how long it would be around. It was just a part of the landscape to me, like Lake Michigan. Um, but it taught me that, like everyone else, I had a right to learn, and that I was welcome, that I could ask questions, that I could learn how to find my way to the answers. And it taught me the importance of being quiet in public spaces. Uh, for the generation that's growing up today, the internet is that window on the world. And to them, it just exists. They take it for granted. And it's only us who have seen it take shape and are aware of all the ways it could be different and how contingent it is uh, that need to worry about it. The coming years are going to decide to what extent the in internet is a medium for consumption, to what extent it's going to lift people up, and how much it's going to be a tool of social control. As it exists today, the internet is kind of a shopping mall. There are two big anchor stores. There's Facebook and Google. And of course, there's an Apple store in the middle. Uh, there's a food court with a couple of punks and lots of surveillance cameras everywhere uh, watching everything that happens. And outside in the parking lot, there's the bookmobile, which is you guys. Uh, there just to add a veneer of classiness to the place. Um, this isn't my dream of the web. It's, my dream of the web is for it to feel like the big city. It's a place where you rub elbows with people who are not like you, some place that's a little bit scary, a little chaotic, full of everything you can imagine and many things that you can't, and a place where there's room for chain stores, for entertainment complexes, but also for people to be themselves, for people to create their own spaces, to learn from one another. And of course, room for big, beautiful, huge, tremendous libraries. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.